Hello, it's Ken Bergen here from Silverchef. And uh, a few years ago, you might have uh, identified me with Profitable Hospitality, which is a business I ran for a long time. Uh, Profitable Hospitality has been part of Silverchef for the last couple of years, and I'm really enjoying having a much bigger stage to work on with education and helping people to run more popular and profitable businesses. Uh, looking at all the technical sides of things, today we're talking menus, a bit about recipe costing, of course, um, and uh, all the other issues that I like to help people with, of course, around uh, staffing and profit margins and technology and efficiency and uh, recruitment and all the rest. But today we're focusing just on menu and how to make more money from the that sales document that you put in front of people and that's really what it is so just a quick reminder to any last arrivals how to use go to webinar you've got a control panel there you've got a question box there any questions you have just please drop them in there and i'll answer them as we're going along i may hold a few till the end if that's appropriate and just a little bit of food photography to warm you up but let's get straight into the main uh, part of today and first up i want to talk about design issues, menu layout. Now, what I put there is a standard uh, A4 page. Now your menu might be bigger, it might be over multiple pages, but there's certain principles about page layout that apply. It might even be a, you know, on a screen, but there's principles about page layout that apply that's really important to know because the real estate on that page influences the choices that people make subtly. I mean, if they are really absolutely want uh, seafood pasta, that's what they're going to have. But there's ways to influence people um, to choose the things that you want. And those things, of course, that you want them to buy are the things that are more profitable. And by profit, I mean more dollar profit, more, you know, more margin in those items. So here's a typical list of things there. And when the eye moves across that page, this is how it moves from right to left and diagonally. So you can see the prime real estate. Um, <laughs> one restaurant owner described to me is this is the waterfront real estate, okay, um, is those kind of top, that top section and diagonally that uh, bottom right. So, you know, things like the no meat, no gluten, the vegetarian options or whatever, it's very important to have those on a modern menu, but they're not going to be big sellers. So they're tucked away a little bit. Things like essential extras, of course, you want to sell those, but uh, again, not so important. Notice that wording, essential extras. Please use that. Um, there's a sort of command there, isn't it? It's just not just an option, but uh, compulsory. Anyway, I don't know how you are with all your sales of side dishes. We're going to talk a bit about that later on as, as we go through. So important thing about page layout, and let's look at a bit more on page layout here as well. Um, here we've got a menu, just to, you know, typical kind of casual cafe menu with no columns. You notice the density of all that text. Now, it's well described. We've got all the wording in there, and it's actually quite important to include all the ingredients these days because you know how people, fussy people are, they'll come back and say, you didn't tell me there was mayonnaise in it or, you know, I'm allergic to chili or whatever. So that's important. But being that dense is actually quite unreadable and people get tired, they get bored reading through all that and they just stop. So it's more important, I believe, to have two columns. Again, if we go back to, you know, our first menu here, two columns again because it's easier for the eye to scan. And our whole life we've been reading magazines and newspapers in narrow columns. We're used to reading that way. So don't make it harder for people, make it easier for people. Notice we're, it's all, we're almost wanting to seduce them, aren't we, to reading all of it. If you've got some wonderful things there, I don't want them to get bored and only read the first half. We want them to pay attention to everything that's there. Another important principle in menu design is the pricing and how you lay out pricing. Now notice you've got options here with the dollar sign or without the dollar sign. 
with is it nine dollars for this uh let's say it's a side or a side dish a side salad or something like this a nine is it nine fifty or is it nine eighty is it with a dollar or without um I would just hate you to miss out on that eighty cents when you sold a hundred side salads for the day i mean that's eighty dollars that's it could be the sh the wages for one of your casuals. So I know people sometimes feel, you know, our, the look of our, we're very pared back and we're very simple, you know, so it's just nines and tens and things like that. Well, that's fine. But what I call flat pricing, I just think is a lost profit opportunity. You know, as we burrow into those kind of details, that's how we make those that extra margin. Now, with the dollar sign or without, um, to me, what we're, which kind of subtly de-emphasizing that we're talking about money. Of course, we're talking about money, but we just really want to keep people's focus on the wording and the descriptions. Hence, I prefer to take the dollar sign off. Anyway, you decide, but um, a thousand side salads over the course of a week or two weeks at 80 cents each, that's $800. Anyway, you decide. Here's an example of this in action, okay, where we've now notice I have left the dollar signs on here, but notice how the prices have been massaged up. They're all within this, you know, 12 becomes 12.95 or 8 becomes 8.50, but there's actually a 5% increase in sales revenue from the same number of items being sold by just doing that. Now, 5% just because you reprint, you know, you know, you retype the Word document that your menu is, or did a little bit of, uh, you know, rewriting on the blackboard, to me is, um, you know, a seriously good move. So recommend you uh, consider that. Here's another great trick that I wish more people would use with pricing, and it's called decoy pricing. Now, notice if I didn't have $29.50 for the beef and sand crab, which I'm looking, I made these slides, uh, this this particular slide a couple of years ago, and I'm realizing people probably charge you a fair bit more than that, but whatever, leave the prices as they are. The point here is when you add something that is substantially higher like that, the price, now the swordfish fillets are $22.50, um, these sorts of things looking much less expensive by comparison don't get caught up with you know whether the prices i've got here are you know underpriced or whatever my point is here if you can have an item that is you know it's obviously got to be very tempting and delicious and credible not crazy but by putting that there you've reset people's understanding of value within all the other prices that you presenting there i think it's a good trick um, especially if that item is made with a couple of item, a couple of things that are already in your mise en place. You know, you might have a, a sand crab uh, linguine or you're doing the beef uh, several ways with steaks and things like that. So decoy pricing, definitely an easy win. Nesting your prices also helps to disguise them a little. Notice the difference between the right side and the left side. On the left side, we kind of tuck the prices within. Notice I've left the dollar sign on. Maybe I should have taken that off, but by tucking the prices in, again, we're getting people concentrating on the food. On the right-hand side, it's kind of a price. See, I don't want people to think of the menu as a price list. It's a sales list. It's a list of delicious, interesting uh, items that are just right for the situation they're in. You know, the, we go to the hardware for a price list, but we go to a cafe or a restaurant, you know, to have a good time and satisfy our hunger. So let's again subtly disguising the way the prices are presented. Another really easy thing to do is to highlight specials. Now, this might be special specials, or it might actually be just the things that you want to sell. And, uh, 
you know, it might be just little red, red stars or at a seafood restaurant. I uh, um, saw a while back that it was a bit corny, but it said, you know, prime catch it was like a little rubber stamp that they'd put on it now. I don't know what prime actually means these days, but uh, it certainly drew attention to something. When you draw attention to, to things like that, you will sell more of them. Just full stop, end of story. That's just how it will work. We can also do quite a bit with the wording. Again, when we've got these paired back prices, you know, 10 instead of $10.80, um, oftentimes on those menus, I see these very paired back descriptions as well. Now, flathead, W with fries and salad. Okay, now here's the thing. We have got an absolute inundation of tourists just uh, in Australia. Um, just yesterday, I was reading a report from Restaurant and Catering and we got 1.4 million tourists from China to February this year. And within five years, they're expecting almost three times that. It's staggering, it's amazing. My point is, that people who come here often have kind of reasonable to poor English, but technical terminology, you know, Aussies know a flathead is a very good flavoured fish, especially if it's fried, but others have no idea what that is. They wouldn't even know this is fish unless it's in the seafood section. If you just call it a flathead or all those, uh, you know, jewfish or all these other things we use, you're just gonna cause confusion we're not trying to dumb the menu down, but we are trying to make it really easy because when you make it necessary for people to ask what this is, you're putting extra work, unnecessary work on the, with the wait staff. Now, of course, we want them to be attentive and answer questions and be available, but let's face it, oftentimes our staff may be just a little bit newer than they should be. Um, maybe they're too busy, maybe this customers are a little bit shy about asking. So we want the menu to be fully and completely self-explanatory. We want it so that people don't have to ask, their questions are answered without it, of course, turning into an encyclopedia. Notice also there in those descriptions, it's a full description, but also we're using what I call words that sell, words that make me feel hungry, words that, you know, yum, Fish and chips, just what I feel like on a cold, wet day like it is today. I actually do. <laughs> and here's some simple words, you know, crisp, tender, pasture fed, line caught. We talked about essential extras, light, you know, location descriptions. If there's a place called Sunny Bay or Limestone Hill or whatever it is in your place, you know, the L word, that first word there, local, very, very powerful. Now, local could mean you know, if you're in South Australia, it could just mean somewhere in South Australia. It doesn't have to mean down the road or around the corner. My people respond to that very strongly. Just when you put that sort of wording in though, of course, be prepared to back it up and make sure whoever is actually serving that um, to people uh, knows what they're talking about and you know, can talk about, you know, where uh, Limestone Hill actually is and, um, you know, the sheep farm that's there or whatever it is. But I see, a lot of menus that are a little bit light on with the description, I think more can be done uh, to make it, uh, yeah, make people go yum. That's really what it's about, isn't it? There's some other irritations that I see quite often in menus that uh, just, again, they just make it harder for people to read and slows them down and just means fewer sales, tiny text. Now, if people didn't bring their reading glasses because, you know, they're going out with someone special, they're wanting to impress and they don't want you to know that they need readers, well, guess what? If the menu, if the text is too so small, they're going to struggle with all of that. You're just going to sell less. The reverse text thing I find intensely irritating. You see that more on web pages, um, but sometimes we see it on printed pages as well. I just don't understand that. If you want to use colours or blacks your colour, there's other ways to use that without reversing the text. And the uh, capital thing, capital letters thing on the left is just a crazy, you know, very well known um, sales killer in that case. 
This is another really important point in your menu layout that I want you to take control of because when you have sections in your menu, the person, the, the, the person, <laughs> the thing that is at the first or the last, especially the first, will sell more just because it's first. So we need to have our highest profit item there, first and last. You will sell fewer items in the middle than the first or the last. Okay, so I've just given you some examples there. And this also applies if people are giving a verbal description, they're giving, uh, you know, going through the menu and describing maybe there's four specials today. People generally will only remember the first one and maybe the last one. They're unlikely to remember the second one. The point is, have two specials, not four. But, and also, when you're putting the menu together, this is where person who's designing, you know, putting the, all the, the menu items together for you, um, take control of this from a marketing point of view. It might be that chef's writing it all up, but make sure they know which ones to put higher and which ones to put lower, okay? This is a simple one. Um, I sometimes see menus where it's in price order from, you know, less expensive to more expensive. I just don't see the sense of that because, you know, sometimes a less expensive or a middle priced item is actually uh, more profitable than one of the higher priced items. So it should have prime position. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about another essential on a lot of menus. Now, there may be some fine dining people who are um, with us on the webinar. You're probably not going to have a special kids menu, but you'll certainly have some options for children that people will know. And you're not the parent, but parents actually really crave something that is uh, reasonably good for their kids and they know their kids are going to say yum instead of having to always go for the default nuggets or uh, fry rubbish etc um, so how can you do that well one thing you could do is actually call it your healthy kids menu and design accordingly straight away we're sending a positive message there um, yeah vegetables and fruit and dips and uh, I don't know about colouring in and all those things these days. You know, most kids are on their phone or uh, on their iPad as the uh, the activity these days. I think that gets a little bit corny doing that. But I'm just saying, think this through. Baked and grilled products, again, things that are on your in your mise en place anyway. But we want our parents to who come along to feel that the kids menu is a positive part of the program, not a kind of a minus. McDonald's will always have to live with the fact that they make our kids fat and, you know, have turned everyone into kind of eating by their, with their hands. They're never going to overcome that. But you can be one of the good guys, not one of the baddies with this situation. Um, just that last point too about child conscious staff. Remember, a lot of your young staff are way too young to be parents themselves. They've probably still got younger brothers and sisters at home and you know how annoying they can be so they'll often bring their own kind of attitudes and behavior around children to work and oftentimes that is just not appropriate they need training they need an understanding they need yeah whatever they need but don't assume that they know how to look after kids well you know blow me down the other day i saw um some parents being brought their kid their drinks ahead of the children being brought their drinks. You see the look on the children's face. It's crazy, but that's just a simple mistake. Another item that I think needs lots more attention because there's lots of wonderful profit opportunities there is your desserts. Now, what's your dessert menu like? Is it actually craveable? That's a strong word, isn't it? Is it do people really think about your certain dessert on your menu and they kind of almost go there regardless of what what's on the first part of the menu and uh, you know my old saying i've said many times sugar and air and water is profit um uh, my gelato machine um that i used to have in my cafe boy that thing just went 
day in, day out. And what were we combining? Well, it was milk uh, and sugar and air in that case. Um, that was sugar, air and milk to make profit. That's what gelato is. It's not even cream based. But I don't know what your version of that is. And sure, people are wanting healthier. They're wanting lighter. They're wanting less sugar. And if you've got the right desserts, you're still going to be able to um, attack, attract quite a few people, even if it's just to share. We're talking about the almost healthy items here, and that's where we need the range of things. Um, I noticed a dessert menu the other day that said it, it had the same vegan and vegetarian and gluten-free symbols beside the dessert items that it did on the main course. I thought that was interesting. Anyway. Um, vegan desserts, who'd have thought? In fact, you know, if you're doing something fruity, of course it's a vegan dessert, but just, just be ready. We want to sell that extra item and we want people to know how to sell it, you know, that upselling thing. Just look at the sequence of sales with desserts, you know, sometimes where people are just clearing the dirty plates from the main course away and they're already asking, you know, do you want dessert? Uh, no, wrong, wrong timing, wrong question. <laughs> you know, this needs again. This is another level of seduction. I talked about that at the beginning with um, the menu design, but dessert sales. It's a visual seduction. It's descriptions. It's wording. Would you like to share a dessert, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the display, the way you carry it to other people so everyone can see what's going past, all those sorts of things. I want to look at a few um, sales word, a bit of sales wording in a minute around that sort of thing as well. But one of the things you can do straight away is look at your dessert strike rate. So what that means is look at uh, last week or yesterday or wherever you got your point of sale figures from and look at how many customers and how many desserts you sold. So if you had 100 customers and you sold 15 desserts, I say shame on you because it should be way more than that. I know people are on diets and I know et cetera, et cetera, but it just means you probably haven't got the wrong, right desserts on your menu or the sales or, or the staff weren't describing them properly or the sequence of suggestion wasn't done properly. You know, Aussies love their desserts, full stop. We just got to serve different desserts than what we were doing five and ten years ago. And my challenge to you is to get your dessert strike rate to up to one in three, because then you're actually hitting the mark. These are people who do want to sell something. And maybe it's, you know, can I bring you three spoons with that to share? Absolutely, you can. So there's a challenge. Desserts, very, very profitable. If you find the right recipes and present them in the right way, increases our total sales. Unfortunately, not done well in a lot of places. Just a couple of accessories uh, that you probably got in your kit. The uh, the laminator, cheap as chips these days. You know, please reprint those menus regularly. Scruffy menus, no, no, no. That's a, a sales killer as well. And little rubber stamps. Um, you can get them in office works or $2 shops just to sort of highlight things on menus. Remember we talked about, the, you know, putting a highlight on something and you'll sell more. Um, only a few dollars for that sort of thing as well. I want to talk a little bit more now about the sales language and the sales process. And one of the first people you have to send on their way is the sales prevention officer. Now, you know who this grumpy uh guy or gal is who uh, haven't smiled for uh, a few months and whatever their personal problems or their issues or whatever, um, we come to your place to have a wonderful time, to enjoy ourselves. Now, even if that just means a quick coffee, I've got 10 minutes on the way to work, I still want to relax and have a sunny smile. And if you haven't got people who are doing that, um, they're not going to be presenting the menu. They're not going to be bothered talking about the extra side salad or all those sorts of things. So just um, just a bit of a reality check for you. You know, who's who's on the sales desk? Uh, who's presenting the menus? How's that whole process going? But let's talk about some of the scripts that your staff need to be able to say so naturally that it doesn't look like they were even taught how to do it. 
please remember, most of our staff were not born with a selling gene. You know, I'm an Aussie. Um, I say Aussies weren't born with a selling gene. I think most people, most young people who are serving, it doesn't come naturally to them all. You, you've got to train them and drill them and practice and go over and over and over. Here's one just for you to think about. It's not quite a script, but it's certainly an action, is the second coffee. So when the staff clear the coffee cup away, do they ask, would you like another one? Um, because how do you sell W coffee sales? You sell everyone a second coffee. But most times that just doesn't happen. Check if it's happening your place. Uh, think back to all the cafes you've been to in the last week. Um, has it happened? Anyway, that's an easy one. But let's look at some of these scripts here. All your staff need to be able to say what their favourite is, and that's a main course, and that's a dessert, and that probably means they have to taste them as well. Now we come up with that thing then of you know oh, I'm a vegan, how can I recommend uh, you know the spaghetti bolognese or one of the meat pastas or something? Well, in that case, it might be the third option. You know everyone loves or you know our most popular is it, but. That second line, you know, our best seller is, that's very reassuring for people to hear that sort of thing. People have to be able to say that. And you'll need to address this issue if people want to be a bit pompous about, you know, I'm a vegan or I hate seafood or this, that and the other. That's fine, but that's actually not what we're doing here. We're not talking about our own likes and dislikes. We're here to give the customers a great time and we need to sell more items. Um, handling the kind of potential negatives, you know, it's spicy, not hot. You might have certain ingredients that people are going, huh, what? I've noticed that with sort of strange Italian descriptions, you know, southern Italian uh, sausages and all these things. People almost delight in having terminology that people don't know what it is. Now, we can get our phone out and do a quick Google search that usually handles it, but really, why should I have to do that? Um, so, yeah. That's part of the script, isn't it? And going back to what I was saying before, you know, your staff, we want them to do the introductory selling, and but oftentimes there's just not enough time for them to do lots of descriptions and lots of discussion and find out what people like and have a good discussion. I wish that could happen, but if not, some of these key selling terms they need to know and practice with them over and over. Um, the expression is drilling, not skilling. Skilling is saying, okay, here's the menu, let's go through it now. Read it together, go through it, spend 10 minutes. Now, do you understand everything? Everyone nods, yes, that's skilling. Okay, come back tomorrow, do they remember? No, they don't. Drilling is going over and over and over until they don't even know they're doing it. Drilling would be when you see your staff go out, clear the coffee, cup and without even thinking they say would you like another coffee that means they've been properly drilled now are we turning into people into robots here just a little bit because your bank balance actually depends on this anyway a bit of a rant here um, and lastly you know the more staff know about the food the flows the sales would just flow naturally they're just their enthusiasm if there's a absolutely I remember our cream caramel gelato we used to make. Oh, wow, that was amazing with the sort of burnt sugar edge to it. It was just incredible. And once staff tasted that, that's all they'd sell. It was just amazing. You know, when people know about it, they'll just keep selling it. Okay, bit of a rant there. Hope that's okay. But this is really an important part of the whole menu sales process. Okay, a bit of a change of gear again now. And talking about photos because they're actually a critically important part of your menu now. And notice, you know, when people are looking at these two, um, a, a beverage and the mussels from Lucio's, uh, that's not a menu, hang on, it's making me hungry. I know they can do, do mussels now, they're doing blood orange aperitivos. And this one on the right, they're doing some strange chai, uh, to chai latte or something like that. This is actually an important part of your menu presentation these days. It's, here we've got menu items one by one,
but every single one of them should be a winner. So given they've got to be a winner, we've got to make sure that the photos themselves are looking very special. And I really recommend you take your food photography very seriously. Now there's a, a free app on uh, Android or iPhone called Snapseed. There's lots of photo apps, but Snapseed is really great. I recommend you have a look at it. Notice the two difference between these two photos. The one on the left is the one I took of the pancakes, which look pretty good. But if you just present it like that, you know, what comes out of the camera is not what the eye is seen because the eye processes light differently. The one on the right, I boosted the light a little bit, I saturated the color, I pushed the color a little bit, all done with this free Snapseed app. It didn't actually take very long at all, but really putting pictures up like on the left is getting half the impact as the one on the right. So if we're accepting that, our social media and our photo things is part of our menu marketing. We need to make every single one of these a winner. You might decide it's starting to get very time consuming and stressful and I'm busy. I know that um, there's someone on your staff who would love to do this, who can be your uh, photography person. There's someone in the kitchen who absolutely needs to be taking photos of every single dish you serve and almost every time service is on they need to be photographing regularly and building up your photo library maybe that same person is also going to be the one who uses snapseed or something else to brighten it up but this is not really an option anymore we've got to have a fantastic visual presentation as well as all those words on the page which we looked at before now we're talking here about your menu on social media so let's just run through as we're uh, let's just run through here where you're going to find it and where it's got to look good. So when you take out your phone, look at your web page and see where the menu is. Now, the menu is actually not a priority tab on your mobile version of your web page. When people are looking on their phone, they want to know, are you open? What's the phone number if they want to ring? And what's the address? They're the, the top three. Menus on your mobile version, well, the mobile version is usually the same as your regular version now. You know, that's there's no longer two versions, but the menu is a bit of a lower priority. But here's a trap that people still fall into. It's that last point I put down there. People got so used to just doing a PDF version of their menu and sticking the link up on their website. Now, that's all very well on your laptop or on a big PC, but on a phone, these things don't scale the way a mobile version of a web page does. And you've got this tiny, tiny text, this irritating little thing we've got to kind of pinch and squeeze and slide around. That doesn't work. So we need to present uh, our menu or maybe a good selection of it in easily readable form on the web page. Here's another thing to look at. You know, Google your venue on your phone. Go to Google app. You know, put in um, pizza in Edgecliff or wherever you are, pizza in Geelong, and see what comes up. You, there's your web page. Um, is the menu pop up there as well? And you might want to just Google that. You know, Cafe X restaurant menu. Um, just a reminder with that too. Have you claimed your Google My Business listing? This is a specific listing that Google has for you. It's listed you already. If you haven't claimed it. The information they put up there is just their guesswork from scraping information from various places. But sometimes they get the the times wrong. Sometimes they get the descriptions inadequate. If you claim it, um, takes a few days to go through the process. Then you can edit and update that. And another important place to put accurate, tempting information about your menu. Your menu is also on the different uh, listings. Um, I'm finding TripAdvisor the most important one these days. Um, Dimmy and Open Table, of course, is there if you're using one of those services for bookings. But even TripAdvisor, I find people haven't claimed their listing there. That's another place where you can go in and correct information about the menu and, of course, respond to people's comments about the menu as well. Facebook. Um, another place, don't need to tell you about the importance of Facebook, but again, given we got these photos, 
Um, we need to have them splashing up there a couple of times a week with the latest temptation, beautiful photos, description of what it is, and um, people will see that. Last change of gears is to look at another way that menus now being displayed, well have been for a few years, but increasingly important is as digital signage. Now there's a lot of sophisticated systems for this, you might have a large venue where you've got screens in different places, you have a small venue where you say this is absolutely not what we want at all, that's fine, but the same principles apply with digital menus. Notice we've got columns, notice we've got pricing, we've got descriptions, we've got colours. I see a lot of menus far too busy, digital menus far too busy um, in takeaway situations. Uh, oftentimes people want to point and look at something um, rather than look at this big confusing sign that's up too high, they've got to tilt their head. But the same principle, I would suggest though, start to think about where could we include a digital menu of some type and it can be as simple as having a screen that's run off an old laptop with PowerPoint on it that might have some changing um, images or changing um, slides on it or something. It's actually very inexpensive to do that and there's other systems. I saw one in from Samsung actually in Officeworks a, a few months ago where they've got sort of special um, display software. You can have pictures and animation and all sorts of crazy things but this needs to be part of our thinking going forward. So lots of questions there, um, lots of uh, <laughs> suggestions there, um, a few questions have come in there, I might just, uh, I kept a couple of them towards the end, actually a couple on the social media side of things, if you've got any more questions you'll be getting an email after this, um, please flick uh, me a reply and I can send that uh, to you. You can also send your PDF of the um, presentation if you're interested to see that as well. But just let's go back to um, social media, which was what I was talking about as an important part of menu. Um, someone's asked here about you know Instagram or Facebook or um, Snapchat. Um, one of the other ones, Instagram number one, absolutely, and you, Instagram stories now has taken a lot of the, the heat away from Snapchat. Again, depends on your demographics. Instagram is covering a much wider range group of ages. Snapchat definitely um, in people in their 20s, but I'm seeing most restaurants and cafes that are doing a good job of really concentrating on Instagram and I'd say Facebook number two for that and it can be a combination of uh, you know, provide some links to the menu and back to your web page but try and put a complete information story on Facebook you know a sentence and a picture a couple of sentences that works really well okay just uh, questions here someone Jenna said, love a copy of this. Absolutely, just uh, when you get the email from me, the confirmation, it's, a, it's basically thanks for attending um, email, then uh, you can flick back to me and I'll send you a PDF. Anyway, great going through a topic that I find endlessly interesting and uh, so many profit opportunities for people to get, make more sales and uh, just by rearranging things and getting people describing things in different ways and getting your staff really working hard on it as well. So thank you very much, appreciated sharing the time with you today and uh, think about what are you going to do in the next 24 hours to improve your menu and do a strike rate for something. How many desserts are you selling out of 100 people? Thank you very much.